it's good. So this is a different talk, and mostly a tutorial to learn about hardware design and maybe more precisely FPGA design. So this is a EDA and a open hardware room. So we talk about hardware. And in particular for this talk, we are talking about how to design a chip, not about PCBs. I'll also talk later for PCB designs. And it's not about analog chip, chip which is mostly part of NUCARP and uh, CUBES, but it's about a digital chip. Uh, I would say in the real life, uh, designing a real uh, digital chip is very, very complex, and it's done only by very large company. You need to invest a lot of money uh, for uh, the software, for the um, manufacturing, so we will do something a little bit different. So this is uh, some of the uh, tool you need to build a chip. Very, very expensive. Hopefully, some chips are completely programmable. Thus, most of the chips are, I would say, fixed. They have only one purpose. And there are a few chips named FPGA that are completely programmable, which means that you can see them a little bit like the software. You <coughs> define what you want to do with the chip. And it's almost exclusively a uh, digital chip. So what is inside a programmable chip, which is almost always called FPGA? So you have the inputs and outputs on the side. You have some cells that are programmable and that define a particular function. And you have a lot of nets, a lot of nets that can be configured as a root. So you can program the chip to connect, for example, this pad to this input of this cell. So there is a lot of uh, extra features in the chip just to be able to configure the chip, which means that the chip is uh, slow and somewhat expensive compared to a fully custom chip. So digital is about zero and one. And here I assume you know a little bit about uh, digital computation. That means the basic operations that are used in almost every digital chip, or and and not. So that is the basic building blocks of a, of a chip. And the purpose of uh, digital uh, design is to combine these basic blocks to do something more complex. So for example, if you associate gates like this, you get the XOR function using only AND not an OR gate. And the round at the output of the gate, that means you get the, it's an inverser, so you get the uh, not of a AND in this case. So you can combine gate to create new gates. Here, you, you, here we create so the XOR. And if you combine them, uh, in a meaningful way, you can even do some math. For example, the XOR, here is the output of, uh, for, for all the possible input. In fact, the XOR is just, for one bit, is the uh, same as an addition. So if you have one in, uh, in input, you get one and the result. And if you have two, one, you get you should get two, but because it's only the lowest uh, bit of the output, you get zero. So this is what is called, I would say, half an adder. And so adding on only one bit is not very interesting, but if you get a full adder with output and carry, 
you do something a little bit uh, more interesting to do math. So this is the circuit of a full adder with two input and carry input and the output and the carry of the output. And this is the block schematic for the full adder. Just using the basic, bl the basic uh, blocks <coughs> we have defined uh, before. And what is interesting with the full adder is to combine them to create an adder for here, for example, four bits. So here you really have more interesting, I would say, mathematic uh, computation using only the basic blocks. And if you combine a full adder, you can also do multiplication. So it's even more powerful. This is an example of a 4-bit by 4-bit multiplication. It's not very efficient. It's not very uh, also very efficient in, in time of uh, area, but it does the work. So. If you continue to combine uh, gates, you can do, I would say, almost whatever you want from input and do any computation to create output. Uh, the problem with this kind of circuit is that it's, I would say, either too simple or not very powerful. And you get only power from mathematics if you do F f uh, feedback or recursion. That means you use the output to compute the next input. This works well in maths, but unfortunately it doesn't work at all like this in uh, hardware design. The reason is that you have, I would say, some physical constraints. If, the, if you set value to input, you get value on the output side, but necessarily not at the same time. So for example, you may get the uh, sum before the carry. And if you re-inject directly the output to the input, it will compute something that is not uh, correct because it will use the um, sum, uh, the real sum, but the wrong carry. So at the end, you will get something that is completely wrong and completely uh, uh, unstable. So that's where we need to synchronize, to synchronize uh, signals. And this is a very important uh, notion in uh, all digital circuits. You need a clock to create synchronization, which means to define a time at which the inputs are stable, and at which the outputs, so maybe generally the next clock, will be stable. And this is not only uh, for dealing with propagation, but also to deal with variation of process. I mean, not circuits are created equal. There might be some difference between uh, two chips that are uh, created from the same uh, manufactory for many reasons and to deal with this uh, variation of process the easiest way was to use a clock and to synchronize with a good uh, with a, a correct uh, frequency so this is the other important element of the digital circuit which is uh, flip-flop and it has an additional input the clock and the important point of the clock is that when the clock is rising so this is a, we are using rising edge clocks it defines a particular time at which the input are uh, from the, the input of the, of the flip-flop should be stable, and it memorizes the input, and so uh, writes uh, the input to the output for the next cycle. So during this period, 
the output of the clock will be completely stable. So the uh, computation part could be able to do the computation, and the output of the computation should be ready for the next cycle, just before the next cycle. So at the end, I would say digital design is a mix of computation, <coughs> logic gates, and memorization element, flip-flops. Well, so that's, the, I would say, the basic uh, notion of how to do uh, digital design, at least the theoretical part. So it is possible to write the gates using an uh, improved schematic editor, but it's very tedious, and it doesn't scale, scale very well. So that was how it was done in the early 80s. And during the 80s, uh, people created hardware description language, which is language, I would say, like C, that could be used to describe a complete circuit. And I will show a little bit how it works. So we will use this little board, which, is, uh, which contains a programmable circuit. So it's from, uh, it was from Lattice, and it, it's an um, iStick board. And we will use so 22 euros, not very expensive. And we will use uh, some uh, open source and free tools. So GHDL for the VHDL front-end uses to create the netlist, ArcNipair and I well, ArcNipair to create the bitstream, so the, the file that should be sent to, this, to program this FPGA, and iStorm, which is a tool to actually write the bitstream on this, uh, this chip. So what is the uh, look? Of a, file, of a VHDL file. So if it, if it, in VHDL, the circuit is composed in two parts. There is entity and architecture. So entity defines the interfaces. So this is the interface. We need a clock. And there is five outputs which will correspond to the LED. So if the output is set to, is set to one, the LED is on. And if the output is set to zero, the LED is off. Very simple. So this is the interface of the circuit, and there is a comment that describes how the, la the LED <coughs> are placed on the circuit. So they are here, and it's not obvious to know which one corresponds to which LED, which wire corresponds to which LED. And this is the internal of the circuit, it, it has, <coughs> I would say, one uh, main process, which is some computation, so here, within a flip-flop. So if rising edge means that we will do the computation only on the rising edge of the clock. And the computation is just a counter, and when it, it reach three, million, it is reset to zero, and the LED is flipped. So this is just a way to make LED blink. Uh, not too quickly, otherwise you can't see anything, and not too slow, otherwise you, you can't wait uh, until it flips. So this is a very simple example. And this is, uh, I would say, the one possible way to do the whole work to, to program at the end the FPGA. So first, for VHDL, well, this is a little bit particular to VHDL, you need to analyze the sources so that the system knows about the files. And so this is done using VHDL. And then we do synthesis. So we create a netlist, so the list of gates that is derived from the description, the textual description we have seen just before. 
So we use GHDL for, create, for wait, use this NGHDL as a plugin for creating the netlist, and we say we want to synthesize for this particular circuit. So it creates lab.diff, which is the netlist, which is called the netlist. Then we use ArcNIPR to assign and place the various gates to the, uh, to the FPGA. And for these tools, we need also to define where the LEDs are placed in the, on, the, on the pad. It cannot be guessed by the, by the tool. So you need to specify the input that was created by users. You need to specify the place file for the pads. And it generates an ASCII file that is then uh, used by IcePack <coughs> to create a binary, and then by IcePack to send the binary directly to the chip. So it was it was already done directly for the for this card. In fact, the binary file is uh, stored in a flash on this board, so that it will work directly when I pour, will power up. And I have something a little bit more complex than just blinking. It uh, also rotates. <laughs> so this is a list of tools we have used, so synthesis by, for, by, uh, by uh, Yosis, uh, VHDL frontend, which is my tool, and directly pair to place and route on the chip, and the wall ICE 40 tools uh, set uh, from uh, Clifford, which is iStorm. Any question? <coughs> Yes. Uh, so you're the author of uh, Read Their Content? Yes. And uh, in what stage in it, it's now? What features of Read Their does it support? Okay, so question about the state and feature of the HDL. Okay, so first, the HDL, at least at the beginning, was a simulator. No, no, I, I'm asking about the tool, the, the, the plugin you're using. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so uh, at the beginning, uh, the main purpose of the HDL is to do simulation, which means just not creating a circuit, but uh, testing the circuit just on your computer. This part is, I would say, well advanced. Uh, it supports, uh, as far as I know, everything from the uh, 93 standard and many features from the 2008 standard. For synthesis, which means using VHDL to create a circuit, it's a very, very, very uh, work in progress tool, which it is why I have named it dash beta. And it only supports, well, it's only a proof of concept. So it only supports, uh, uh, I would say, basic feature, but it ha doesn't really support, for example, bus are not well supported, things like that. I would say the proof of concept. I have to put more work and time on it. Any tips for software people doing their first FPGA debugging? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> debugging. It's easier to learn to write it than to debug it. Yeah. Okay, the question is how to debug. Um, usually you don't debug. <laughs> <laughs> That's a possibility. You can get right first time. It's, it's okay. Well, what you, usually, what you usually do is you do simulation. Okay. So you, you do run with a simulator your VHDL design or VLOG design, and you debug it like software. Okay. And then when you try, when you program, it should be almost okay. okay. There are some possibilities, for example, to use an out, a pad to sort an internal signal and use oscilloscope or, uh, or tools like that to debug, but it's very difficult to do debugging on the hardware. 
Okay. <laughs> you. There are not tools that are uh, G-Tag or something like that. You know, or Arduino or... Because it looks like a, a bit like an Arduino or something. Okay, the question is about uh, debugging use, using G-Tag. But G-Tag is not... Well, the first purpose of G-Tag is to I test... Okay, okay. it's... Okay. Uh, the first purpose of GTAG is to do uh, hardware testing, which is not debugging, just testing that the chip works correctly. Uh, then there are some extensions, for example, to read a particular wire or particular the state of a particular uh, flip-flop within a circuit, which could be used to debug your circuit. But it depends on whether it is supported by a particular chip or not. But it's a usual interface to do that, yes. Yes? Um, that's the, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, you go, go, go. You're playing with a 22 euro uh, FPGA there. Um, what are the limitations of that? Can I go to something like Open Cores and get stuff from there, plug it together, and get um, simulate an ARM chip on there, or is it just too small? What, what does 22 euros? So the question is about the limitation of this 22 euro well, chip board. Okay, the main limitation is the size and the number of uh, input and outputs for this chip. Uh, actually, it is already quite large. You can do, you can uh, implement some processor in this chip with a memory with. A, simple uh, uh, graphical output. So it's not that uh, small. Uh, if you want to do something that is very more, more complex, for example, if you want to uh, interface with a, as a PCI card, this chip is not uh, powerful enough to do that. You need to buy a larger chip and a more expensive one. We have time for two more questions. Okay. I didn't see timing constraints in the right. over, so timing constraints for clock and... Okay, the uh, question is about <laughs> there was no timing constraint. Uh, the point is that um, this is a very simple design and it needs to run only at 3 megahertz, so but, but it's way, way below any constraint. Um, I'm not, I don't think, uh, with this um, tool set, uh, tool chain, I, not, I don't think so. I may be wrong, but I don't think so. No, alors, uh, the question is about other uh, chip supported by the um, tool chain. So for a full uh, tool chain, it's, I think it's uh, only, or it's not the only chip, but it's the only family that is completely supported. So why, why you can use a full open source tool chain. There are some effort I have heard to support also Xilinx uh, devices, but it's far from being done yet. But you're welcome to join. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. Anybody, one last question, please? Okay, let's, uh, yes. FPGA cost would you be looking at to do a RISC-V design? Well, <laughs> Put a whole CPU on it? Uh, so okay. That's, that's, that's to answer directly, yeah, you can, I think you can use a RISC-V, uh, a small yes. RISC-V uh, processor in this chip. It's possible. It, was, it has been done. Cool. Maybe not to run Linux, but uh, <laughs> uh, at least an embedded uh, program, yes, it's possible. Okay, let's thank Tristan again. Thank you.